Tom's going to show us some of his intarsia work, which he does an outstanding job at. Um, kind of explain what inspires his work. And you've uh, participated in some of the past northern uh, what shows. He does beautiful work. And, uh, seems to find that one that he's going to donate to me just the right piece of wood for that butt on that deer and the ribs and stuff. So it's going to work. You know, he does all that and then help me load that one into my car this evening. <laughs> That's really nice. Thanks, Brad. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to thank the Woodworkers Guild for inviting me to present. Uh, if I'm speaking a little quiet, just let me know and I'll turn the volume up. Uh, again, my name is Tom Kaldonski. I've been doing woodworking since I was in high school. That's where I started cutting my teeth. And I'm sure that's what most of us did. Uh, kind of came into Antarsa because I was making bubbles. Back in the late uh, 80s, I was making basically puzzles out of plywood for my daughters, and they started getting tired of painting them. So I started using different types of woods to make children's puzzles. About that time, I saw an article in Wood Magazine about Judy Gale Roberts. So anybody who is familiar with the Tarza probably recognizes that name, and that kind of helped inspire me to go forward and try some of her projects. Uh, she has a, a site uh, on Intarsa Times, which is a great place for getting plans and patterns for doing that. <coughs> if you look at one or two of my earlier pictures, you might even see a, a pattern of two of hers that have been incorporated into some of my plans. For example, if you look at the far uh, one over there, which is called Twilight's Refuge, up against the wall, you might recognize the raccoon. Most anybody uh, that's done Intarsa has probably done that raccoon. Uh, in that particular painting uh, picture. Uh, first of all, just so you know, Intarsa is actually a 16th century uh, wood crafting uh, technique that was developed back in Italy. So it, it was used a lot if you go over uh, to Europe, you'll see a lot of good examples. And uh, it was brought and kind of made more popular by Miss Roberts as uh, she was doing it on the West Coast. And so after seeing that, uh, I started getting into uh, my works for the Tarsa. And uh, what I would let you know is the pictures that I have here are all pictures of my own making. I started out very simply working with patterns that were very similar to what you might see from a uh, mini pattern person. Uh, for example, here's a, pic here's a, a pheasant that I did, a uh, pretty straightforward pattern. Uh, you can see I've got multiple woods on there. Uh, I've got some cherry, some uh, oak, and some uh, black walnut in it. I uh, couldn't find anything red enough, so I had to cheat and use a little paint. Uh, some of the things that, that you learn in Intarsa, though, are the green patterns. So if you look, for example, at the wings, how I use the green from a circular knot, you can see on the tail the greens go that direction. Uh, learning to read that green is an important part of Intarsa. And you'll see that as we talk a little bit more about my projects. So that's kind of where I started with making up a number of pieces like that. Uh, actually, I annually give away a couple of these things to a couple of scholarship programs every year. And they use them to help generate some revenues and funds. Now, early on, I also looked at some other patterns that were relatively simple <coughs> that looked like this particular one right here. Uh, you can see this pattern is uh, pretty straightforward. It's got four different woods in it, uh, just to get the contrast. But what's unique about this particular thing is you can see the thinness of the wood. I actually stacked four pieces of wood to cut up four of these at the same time. And so when you when you do our entire side, you can do stack cutting as well, which obviously helps your production. Uh, again, if you look at the picture over here, you'll see there's a couple samples right down in the, in the bottom there uh, that show the same duck pattern. They were all cut at the same time. They're all the same pattern, just different combinations of the wood. Uh, I've done a hummingbird pattern of that nature, and you might recognize the the wall, uh, the uh, raccoons uh, holding the wall from one of the magazines. So those are some of my earlier pieces, and I just put them on a simple cut uh, bandsaw box for some decoration. That's the beauty of Intarsa, is you can use it for all types of decorations. Now what I've brought to, to you here tonight are some of uh, my best pieces, I think. Uh, the 
first one you see here, I titled Bugle Boy, which is an intarsa of an elk. Uh, again, one of the things that I've been very much doing on all my pieces, and if you look at each piece, you'll generally find what I like to call the signature piece of wood from my junk pile. To that, I'd point to the piece on the very bottom here, which is kind of an off-cut piece showing the natural grains from a piece that was just sitting out uh, in my yard. But when you put it into a picture, you can see the intricate design that none of us here can really improve upon what's there. So I usually try to incorporate grains of that nature. The other thing is, as you look at the shoulder here, you can see how the shoulder and the back side of the deer has grains going in that direction. Uh, you can see the neck, I've selected a piece that's got grains going this way, and the legs are tucked with grains going that way. Uh, one of the challenging parts of these pictures is to pick the back piece of wood. So when you're out there at Menard or Lowell's or wherever you want to go buy lumber, that's where you start. And when you've got a project in mind of this nature, you got to figure out what's that background piece going to be. Uh, this one was picked because I knew I was going to do a pine forest and I wanted something kind of simulating that. And this kind of shows like a sunrise in the morning. So that's kind of how that piece was selected. I use a variety of different woods that you can see in there. Uh, there's probably about a dozen in this particular picture here. Uh, the, the, the next picture, if you look at it, is called Leader of the Pack. That was kind of a, a little study I did uh, on what it means in eye placement. If you look at each of the deer, excuse me, each of the uh, wolves in it, you can see that their eyes are all going different directions. And actually, if you study it close enough, you can tell who's the leader of the pack based on what the wolf is looking at. So each set of eyes is pointed to look at a specific <coughs> item. In one case, the, deer, uh, the uh, wolf is looking down at a rabbit hiding in the corner of the entire side. You can see him down in the corner. He's pretty dark in the pine trees there. You can see there's another one looking at the, the chickadee that's uh, up there. Uh, and one's looking straight out at you. There's a, a good shot of the little chickpea that's put in there. Black walnut and, and then this guy can be looking at that or if you actually realize it, he's looking at the deer in the background. Uh, you'll see the deer way in the background on the hill and his intent is that he's the leader of the pack because he's looking for the larger quarry. Uh, you can see I use a lot of varieties of wood that may not be used in some of your traditional woodworking senses. I had a lot of scraps left over that I wanted to use up. That's kind of why I got into this. So you'll see me starting to introduce on this side by the raccoon. You can see I started introducing some bark, some offcuts. I buy a lot of rough cut lumber and you can see how with something like this, that bark actually makes a feeding tree for the raccoon to sit on. I'm using some unconventional woods that other people might not necessarily use uh, in their designs. But it adds nicely to this type of picture. As you look to the next picture over, uh, you'll see the one called The Legend of Ten O'Clock Kiss. Yes. Question? Are you going to talk at all about the kind of steps or the process? Yes. I'm going to get into that here real soon. Just introducing you to the pieces and then I'll get into that. Uh, this is 10 o'clock Charlie. Uh, this one has been inspired by my deer hunting stand. Uh, a great place in the father in laws farm. I get to go to the same stand every year and shoot Charlie every year. Uh, it works, believe me, it works. Uh, this one, what's really interesting on this one is, again, learning this grain selection. If you zoom in on the ribs, you can see that I picked, I picked a specific uh, piece of cherry wood there basically simulate the ribs and you can see how the piece next to it basically helped show you the back side of the deer. Now some of the techniques that I'll point out to you, if you look just above the deer you'll see uh, some of the fillers, the little round spots, those are simply dowels. You can get all kinds of dowels, different sizes, different makes, that makes for an interesting technique in the book. So that's when you see that 
it's kind of a fillery between bigger pieces. So uh, I don't uh, cut an entire board for the whole picture. I try to blend all these woods, and each piece is individually cut. The, the last picture over there is Twilight's Refuge. Uh, that's one I'm rather proud of. Uh, it won the first Intarsa Prize for Blockbuster Woodworking. Annual woodworking show. Well, that one was entered in the national contest and it won the first prize. It has 22 different varieties of wood. So, generally, I'm in the dozen range, but that one has 22 different pieces in it. And you can see I'm mixing flowers, you can see I've got a stork, uh, obviously, all kinds of waterfall. Uh, there are things such as the ducks hiding in the swamp when landing, there's a white tailed deer hiding. Uh, in the uh, woods, there's that buck in the background. I, it's kind of a signature thing I do on most of my pictures is hide these things in them. This one's got about a dozen different things hitting into it. So what you'll notice from my intarsa that is a little different than some of the folks that do intarsas, they'll start with this one pattern and do a nice little pattern. And that's where I started. But eventually I decided to start doing mainly Minnesota wildlife in Minnesota scenes. And so the whole intent is I'm doing things that you would see and encounter in Minnesota, or this happened to come after I was out in Colorado on an elk hunt. Uh, so I, I am an avid hunter. And so those are some of the things that inspired me. Well, at one time, uh, I happened to have a birthday. And with that birthday, I was given a birthday card that looked something like this. And that became my inspiration. And there's where we lead into how I do some of the things that I do. Uh, don't ask me to draw you a picture of a deer. It ain't gonna look very good if I just try to do a feed. I'm not really an artist drawing that type of wood. I'm an engineer. My secret weapon is right here. I use a scale. With the scale, I go on a picture like this and lay out a grid pattern over this deer and I can then plot points from critical points on the deer and then that's what leads to what you see on this large paper here which is a pattern of a project I'm in the middle of right now. It's kind of hard to see because it's laying flat but that picture is on this piece of paper and basically I've plotted it out. You can see the grid lines and by doing that that's how I'm able to draw a pattern of this nature. What you'll notice, there's five or six deer in this particular picture. Uh, it's called whitetail woodlands. And what I brought is a sample of the whitetail buck that's prominent in the picture. And that you can kind of see here is him in progress. I've started him before and actually done one of these and gave it away for that scholarship program I was telling you about. Uh, you can see at this point, I've got the horns cut and pretty much the deer is all cut and segmented in cherry. You can see that I have a backer board, so all this gets glued onto a backer board uh, once you cut this pattern out. And then you'll notice, for example, this area is a little bit higher than the rest of it. Uh, there's an, a second backer board underneath there to help bring that thing out. Uh, as you look at my picture, you can see I stress a lot on three-dimensional, uh, that perspective of depth. That's what I think brings a lot of interest to my pictures. Uh, with that, this particular item will then be shaped and cut, rounded and sanded. And in the end, it'll form a nice rounded shaped deer, similar to the ones you see uh, in my pictures back here. Again, there's that signature piece of wood I always kind of try to put with the picture. Right now, it's to this level. I've already got them cut out and in a rough frame board and I've got the rough pieces uh, for the deer. The interesting thing that you also need to do uh, as you're working on these things is uh, you have to be able to understand what the finish is going to do to your wood. Okay? Uh, we all work in lots of different finishes. I pretty much stayed with a variety of woods and I used a polyurethane finish. Uh, my preference is to use a satin finish, which you see on those. On uh, this one, I tried uh, a semi-gloss, so it gives it a slightly different look. Uh, 
what you have to be able to do, and it's illustrated by these two pictures here, uh, which is the leader of the pack picture in the middle. If you look at this picture, you'll see in my right hand a copy of that as it looked before there was any finish on it. And you can see that it looks totally different than what the finished product does uh, when you're all said and done. And pretty much I keep all these pieces loose until I put the finish on them and see what the color looks like before I would glue it onto the back of borders. So that's one of the skills you have to figure you out. Use any stains? Uh, I, I haven't really used much stain, but you could. Uh, I actually know people who will uh, cut a pattern out of an entire board and just stain the different pieces, different colors. And that would give you a similar type of a, a look. I've chosen to use the different varieties of wood. Uh, the woods I use are predominantly ones that I cut on my father-in-law's farm uh, in western Wisconsin. So I'm using a lot of oaks, walnuts, cherries, maples, birches. Uh, but I do go you know, to the Proctor store once in a while and might mix in a purple heart, uh, which is the, uh, the dark wood uh, in the Twilight's Refuge. Uh, sometimes I'll have a, a piece of zebra wood, or I might put some holly or some mahogany. So I do mix some of those in, especially when I have a scrap of a project. If, if something doesn't quite turn out the color that I want, then I'm able to rework it. It also helps me try to keep the pieces smoother. Uh, one thing that I found in some of my pieces is if you glue them all down, you might have a nice sanded piece when you start, but then you put some finish on it, all of a sudden you get the fuzzies. And so that's why I've started just gluing the finished pieces on the pup pattern. Generally, it's a big jigsaw puzzle. You see here or in any of it's just done either with a disc sander or a drum sander. Uh, I also use, uh, when you're getting into the areas like this, you've got two separate pieces. So I found a little Dremel tool works nice just to rough that edge off. And the reason I take that edge off there is otherwise you can get little fuzzies along those edges. So I just a quick little rounding with a drum with a drum sander on it, uh, that's what I use. But the bigger shaping is all of this sander or drum sander. Yes? Don't you, if you have all the pieces done and a finish on them, and they're all dry fit into the frame, you start gluing, don't you ever get to the point where you go, damn, it doesn't fit anymore. <laughs> Everything slides, do you know? That was all the time. Oh, okay, so it's not a big deal. It, you just it, it, sand it, off the excess? Off. Off. <laughs> well, if you okay. start with a pattern that fits perfectly on a piece of paper, and each one of these will slide and move a little bit as you're going, or you have that saw cut that you have to make up. Uh, that's how I come up with patterns like this. How do you fill some of the gaps using these dowels? A lot of times you see me using the grasses, like on Twilight's Refuge. You see how the grasses are there? So if I have a gap that shows up there, in goes another piece of grass. So those are some of the techniques I use to address that. But yes, they do move. Yes? Yeah. You said you glue one piece at a time? Yep. Do you weight it or clamp it in any way? No, I usually just push it into the glue and let it sit. And then I try to glue the whole piece up in one setting or a predominantly a good share of it in one setting. Now like I'll start down here and then I'll just start working up. I'll probably place the major piece and then just start filling it in and then as I have a gap in here I'll start putting the dowels in. The dowels make great fillers because you can have lots of different sizes uh, and so I'll start with these bigger pieces. And generally I try to get all the pieces glued in one setting. Saturday afternoon working most of the afternoon. <laughs> is it glued just on the back side of the piece then, or do you glue the sides and the edges of the I actually use a combination of that. Glue goes on the back of every piece, but as I'm gluing the pieces in, I'll have one piece there, and as I look at the next piece, I'll glue it on the back, but I'll put a small bead along the side that's going to go up against the addition to the next piece. So if I'm gluing this piece here in, I'll put it on the back, and then there'll be glue put along this edge here, so that as I put it together, you get some adhesion that way. So I do put it on kind of like two sides, if you would. 
Yes. Could you be more specific as to the type of equipment you use? Uh, well, I have a shop smith. Uh, that's the primary tool that I use. And so I've got my disc sander, I've got a drill press, I've got the circle saw on there. Uh, I have a separate scroll saw. I've got planers. You heard me talk about different thicknesses. You know, you'll see all my there's lots of different thicknesses. In some cases, I'll sand a piece down thinner or I'll plate it thinner or I'll put back of boards to get that three-dimensional effect. Uh, I've, got, I've got my pretty well stock shop. Uh, I've got a jet table saw, I've got my other saws, all kinds of sanders. Uh, those are the things that I use. A lot of hand tools. The Dremel, the Dremel tool is an important one. The what do you use with the Dremel saw? What's that? What do you use with the Dremel saw? Uh, in the saw, I generally go from one eighth to one quarter inch in size. There are times, for example, like on the Eagle Law, most of the Eagles have done with a half inch blade. Because they're bigger, longer, so I can make those cuts a whole lot faster through that long blade. Uh, but generally, that's, I use the smaller blades. Uh, I would say the majority of my cuts under hands are an Eagle quarter inch blade. And that's for the outside of the perimeters. Uh, and when I get to the interior, that's the tight curves. That's where I'll go to the eighth inch blade sometimes. If, if I can't move the quarter inch, I start leaning towards the scroll saw. The, scroll saw. the other thing that you have to be aware of is when you have your pattern of this nature, you know, a lot of times my piece of plywood will start this large, and when I glued it on, all of a sudden, okay, there it is, this piece of plywood. But you've actually got to come in and cut right along here and recut that pattern again if you're going to then take this whole thing and put it on a picture. That's another step a lot of times that you'll see that's there is having to cut that. So you end up cutting a lot of uh, a lot of different times along the edges and resanding and retouching finishes. Yeah. You said the scholarship fund um, sells these, right? What's that? You said the scholarship fund you work with sells the pieces that you that make the it, It's a it's a raffle. Oh, I see. Okay. I just curious. I just give it to them for an annual raffle at a golf tournament, but they sell a bunch of tickets on it. Who, who are the customers, I guess, who buy the tickets? Uh, predominantly, most people in my family that go to the golf course. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's a memorial type thing. So, and it, it, it goes to a school in western Wisconsin where I grew up. And it's just one way of me making a contribution back to them. Yes? When you're laying it out, do you do like this uh, stained glass where you sometimes have a left border and a bottom border? Generally, that's what I do, yes. And usually it starts by the signature piece, like this piece down here. And I'll start, you know, you'll see it's in different places in different woods, but I do exactly that. I don't necessarily always do the left and go, but I start in one corner, yes. And I'm saying when you make some of those fine cuts stick on the, on the grasses and stuff, do you use a paper pattern on the top or do you use your drill saw or do you do it just by hand or by eye? My grass, I'm, my grass is usually at the scraps that I already just cut off, you know, the pieces that are laying on the floor, I'm picking them up and then I'm free sawing them. Free sawing. Yeah. Uh, when it comes to these things like this, that's a filler, that's the, the different types of dowels. I'll just take a dowel this long and just cut random links. So you get you get a three-dimensional effect in there. The shadows really help the pictures a lot. Do you transfer your pattern to every piece of them? Yes. Do you use paper or craft? What I use, and if you look at this one, you have time afterwards, you'll see this is a tracing paper. Uh, so I draw my pattern on the tracing paper, and I forgot to bring my other secret weapon. Uh, borrowed it from my mom, who was a quilter. It's got a little handle about this long, and on top of it's a little pointed wheel. And so if you look at this pattern, you'll see right along the lines, there's all these little holes that go into the wood. And that's generally how I will take a square board put this all over it, figure out where I want the grain in that board to fit in the piece, and then I'll use, I forget what they call that thing, but it puts all these little that holes point, in it. Pointy just, wheel thing. Pointy wheel thing, yes. And I just <laughs> use that to trace the pattern. So that, that's how I do it. And then you can pencil it in with a lead pencil or a white pencil with a print bar. I saw a question over here. I think you answered it already, but do you finish your pieces first and then glue them in, or do you glue them together? 
uh, when I first started, I glued some old ones together and then finished it, but I, I would get some fuzzies. So since then, I've graduated to trying to finish the pieces beforehand. You can spray over it than after? Yes. There's probably as many, I, about a half a dozen coats that I put on them. I mean, I want them to last for a long, long time. And I suspect they'll get wet somewhere along the line for some reason or another. So you finished your glue up, and then do you do square cuts and square the edges? I usually try to start from the frame now. I used to do something like that, but it was tough to handle this big thing as it got heavier and heavier. So what I do now is I will, that's why I like this frame. I actually build this interior frame here first on a piece of plywood. And that way there's my square references. And then I work inside to fill in what I want to fill inside that frame. And then I add this stuff outside. That's why I like this frame. So hopefully you learned a little bit something tonight. Hopefully it inspires you to do something. Uh, I always find inspiration. And yes, I did meet Charlie at 10 o'clock, 2014, November 22nd. <laughs> so that's the legend of 10 o'clock, Charlie. Thanks for having me, folks.